Now, I'd like to say a very good morning to Laura Dodsworth, but it's not a very good morning, really, is it? Because we're sitting here going, how much more of this do we have to take? I, I just couldn't dislike what's happening in Parliament any more than I do. No. It's, um, it, I can't believe that we're going to be talking again today about Covid passes uh-huh. and lockdowns. Mm. What's going on? I mean, it's a beautiful sunny day, right? We should all be out there enjoying the weather. And in fact, we should be doing this show from the balcony is what we should be doing. It's literally 30 degrees, <gasps> beautiful, um, hot. It's sort of Mediterranean style heat mm. as well. It's really like that, that lovely heat you can enjoy. Yeah. And I was looking forward to Parliament coming back because I thought, well, finally, we'll at least get to be discussing things. But they don't seem to have a clue, do they? Yeah, I, I mean, the thing with the COVID passports um, really worries me because we're not I don't really this isn't this isn't a 101 in how to follow parliamentary process i have as usual prepared tons of notes mike way too much i really do my homework for your show i know that i have five pages of notes on covid passes i'm going to try and start at the top okay with my biggest worries first of all parliament is ignoring its own report into covid passports which said there was no scientific justification they're discriminatory Mm. The government haven't produced a cost benefit analysis or the financial costings and they had concerns about data protection and privacy. None of that has changed. And yet, Nadeem Zahawi has said there are plans to bring in COVID passports this month. The BBC reported on it as well um, as a fait accompli, Mm. but we haven't had a vote in Parliament yet. There's no vote. We don't know when the vote will be. How much time will they have to debate it? Isn't it strange how some um, colleagues of mine, I, I, I use that word very loosely in the media, seem to take this as a done deal. They don't question it. They don't, I mean, Nadine, Nadine Zahawi didn't come on to one show this morning. He did everybody else's show. He didn't do Julie Hartley Brewer because he didn't want to be asked those questions that he doesn't like to answer. Because in the end, everywhere else he goes, they just go, so um, when are we going to have the vaccine passports then? And how helpful will that be? Those are the kind of dopey questions he gets asked by people who don't seem to have a clue what journalism actually is. Mm. Well, the problem is he's been caught out, mm. hasn't he? Because he did put on the record back in February that yeah. there were no plans for yes. vaccine passports. Right. And yet we know at the time that the government had awarded eight contracts, it was reported in the Daily Mail, to develop mm. vaccine passports. Yeah. So there's... I mean, I don't say this lightly. It's beyond a lack of transparency. Yes. They've lied yes. about their plans. They've certainly concealed them, haven't they? I'm Even gonna... if you were being generous, you would say they've certainly concealed their intentions. I am i don't like to say lying lightly, I really don't, but they have lied about this. So in some very gentle interviews, as you say, he's not putting himself through the paces with the most uh, tricky interviewers, such mm. as Julie Hartley Brewer, who does such a good job holding people to account. Yeah. He has still given enough clues away that should be making people really worried. Mm. He's talked about vaccine passports being useful in the longer term. So what does that mean? Yeah. Now, Tom Hunt was interviewed, MP Tom Hunt was interviewed by Mark Dolan on GB News mm-hmm. this week and said he thinks COVID passports will work in the short term. Yes. You know, as long as, you know, they, they come to an end as quickly as possible. Yeah, but what how will they work, though? But, but exactly what does that mean? Because what does that mean? They don't work, right? All they do is they create more work for people who run venues. Can you imagine, for example, there was a football match at Wembley on Sunday, England versus Andorra. Mm-hmm. Everyone was there, 85,000 people. No vaccine passports. Suddenly now what you want is for somebody to check that somebody's got a vaccine passport 85,000 times. Now, I can only imagine the kind of delay that's going to cause. You're going to have to get to the game sort of four hours before you were planning to because the queues are going to be horrendous, aren't they? Well, you'd Just think for so. one thing. I mean, they, there's no scientific justification for them as the um, Public Administration Constitution Affairs Committee found. We had the Boardmasters events that led to 4,700 cases of COVID mm. after the event, and they had COVID pass, passes. Right. So they don't really work. But the thing I wanted to really hone in on there was the longer term. Yeah. What does that mean? What's mm. the plan for COVID passports? What's really the plan? Yeah. Is there a sunset clause? And if they told us there was a sunset clause, would we believe it unless they wrote it in blood? No, I don't think we would. Even if they wrote it in blood, we wouldn't believe it. Because you know at the what? moment, I don't think I believe a word any of them say. Yeah, and that's a really, really depressing stage to get to. Yeah. It's really eroded trust. And I think the whole notion of COVID passport passes does erode trust. How about trusting people if they have symptoms to just stay at home? That's what we could have done all along. Yeah. Bullying people, coercing them into getting vaccinated shows no trust mm. whatsoever in no. people. And it's going to backfire. I think so, it already is backfiring, don't you? In I terms think, of people slowing down uh, getting a vaccine because they're not sure 
that actually the early promise that they made towards the end of last year that vaccination is the way out of this those were their words apparently isn't no and i spoke to two 19 year olds at a party recently and they hadn't really thought about whether they'd be vaccinated or not i mean it's not really a top consideration if you're young and fit and healthy but they said because of the covid pass they would never get vaccinated mm. Now, this has been borne out in some studies. Unison um, have come out against mandatory vaccinations, as you'll have seen in the news. Yeah. And they did a survey among 4,000 care home staff. And they found that, um, right, well, for a start, 88% have already had one vaccine. So why we're mandating mm. it, I don't know. The uptake is great. But among the um, care home workers who haven't been vaccinated, they're twice as likely not to be vaccinated because of COVID passes and threats. Yeah. So it's already backfiring And many there. of them who are leaving that business because they can't any longer work in it are going to work in the NHS where you don't require a, a, um, a vaccination to work. And you kind of go, right. But then this week they said, did they not, Sajid Javid, that mm -hmm. he was going to introduce mandatory vaccination for people in working in the NHS. I don't see how they can. Um, I, I don't really quite know what to make of it. If you assume... If you assume that they have the best intentions and they know what they're doing, this plan doesn't really make sense. The Telegraph reported at the end of August that six out of 10 care homes are going to have to sack staff who won't be vaccinated. Yeah. So an industry which already doesn't have enough staff is gonna have an acute staff shortage in the winter. Yeah. So despite the warnings about staffing problems, the government are gonna roll out mandatory vaccinations for all NHS workers. Mm. I have a dear friend who's a nurse who I know will resign mm. over this because she doesn't want to be bullied. Right. She's had all her vaccinations Well, there's the quite past. a large number of people in the NHS who haven't been vaccinated for whatever reason, right? And that's their choice. Yeah. I think that's their choice. If the patients who've been offered a vaccine um, have accepted it, then they have the protection that the vaccine gives them. And they don't need to worry about everyone around them being vaccinated. Mm. But I think that what this could lead to is another acute staff shortage for the NHS this winter, mm. when we know they're worried about COVID and other respiratory diseases. Add on to that the fact that we've got 5,000 fewer beds. And what does winter look like? Mm. But we've got 5,000 fewer beds because they moved the beds out. We've also got the capacity to have 12,000 extra beds, if we wish, in those hospitals, uh, the Nightingale hospitals that were set up in order to take the overflow. But we couldn't use them because we didn't have enough people. I mean, there's nobody actually thinking about this in the round, is there? The NHS has been in crisis, literally, for about as long as I can remember. I don't remember a winter that happened that where we didn't get told that the NHS was in mm. crisis. And yet, nobody's bothered to fix it. Nobody has bothered to reevaluate exactly what they're doing wrong, because they're doing a lot wrong. So this isn't a new crisis. It's not a new emergency. The COVID epidemic started in this country in March 2020. Mm -hmm. The idea that we should be prepared within the NHS this winter isn't, isn't a new idea. It's not come out of the no. left field. It'll be the second winter when we've had COVID. Yeah. So that we'll have fewer beds, no nightingales, and now a forthcoming staff shortage if they mandate the vaccine mm. is really worrying. So what might happen in that scenario? Might it be that we have to lock down to save the unsavable? Mm. And lo and behold, fire breaks and lockdowns are announced for this autumn. And these are also things which clearly do not work because if they had worked, we wouldn't be where we are. Because the bottom line for me is that we did not ever overwhelm the NHS, right? Mm. Uh, the NHS could have been overwhelmed in January when the numbers were very, very high, but it wasn't. And when we were locked down in January, the numbers got higher. So it wasn't as if we can make that ridiculous argument and say, well, it could have been worse. We don't know how much worse it would have been. Well, that's true. But it was pretty bad. It was as bad as it's ever been and much worse than it is now when we're not locked down. So clearly the lockdown is, is, is immaterial, isn't it? Well, the... There's lots of um, data now to show that infections have peaked mm. before lockdowns yeah. in this country. So lockdowns can't be attributed with um, a decline in, right. in infections. There's, um, there's now a plethora of studies around the world showing that lockdowns don't work. Mm. There's um, a new one that's come out from researchers at the Rand Corporation and University of Southern California. And they've said that COVID-19 lockdowns didn't just not work. They've caused more deaths rather than reduced them. Again, this isn't a new idea. So we've got the studies now which are proving it, but disaster and death planners, and therefore the government whom they advise, knew this yes. when we went into lockdown. Um, I interviewed a veteran disaster planner called Professor Lucy East Hope, and the interviews are in my book. When she was planning death capacity in the UK, she said that she would plan four deaths from lockdown as a result of obstetrics, delayed and missed oncology mm. appointments, 
um, not going to A&E, uh, domestic violence, suicide, yeah. sepsis. And or even just not going to your GP, which is still going on. Yes. Right? So she would plan four lockdown deaths for each COVID death over the next two to five years. Yeah. And the government would have known this. Yeah. So the idea that we would lock down again when we know they haven't worked, but they are also harmful, mm. is is wrong and not just that the government has obstinately refused to provide cost benefit analysis mm. of the lockdowns we've already done yes and they keep saying there's going to be an inquiry but i'm not sure there ever will be it's the same argument they're using now for the schools and the vaccination of, of children because they say well we want to avoid interrupting their education well the only reason you interrupted their education last time was because you interrupted it you know covid didn't interrupt it you didn't have to shut the schools you didn't have to make people go home uh, because they had been sitting next to somebody who might have had a positive test even though they were well mm. you know and so the, the idea that vaccinating uh, the children is somehow going to stop them locking down the school is a nonsense because they don't have to lock down the school absolutely absolutely Pro produce the cost benefit analysis mm. of lockdowns model accurately the difference between introduction and non-introduction of measures yeah and then let's have an informed an informed look at it. Yeah. But just like with COVID passes, they have absolutely willfully and I think immorally refused to provide the full detailed analysis mm. of huge changes that they want to impose on the country. Right. And no matter how high the numbers of people dying ever were, they were never more than about 5% of the numbers of people dying, period, in any given day. Because we have, as I've said, till I'm blue in the face, 50 to 1600 people a day die in this country, right? And the last time we looked, I think um, it was at, at its highest recently, it was running around about 100 people dying. I don't even know what the figure is now because they don't put it out anymore. Now they just use percentages because it's, you know, it sounds better. But basically, in any given day from last March, you look at any day you like, you will find that no more than 5% of the deaths are attributable to COVID. So um, I'm not as up to date on the figures I was, having just got back from holiday. Yes, we're going the, to talk about uh, that in a minute. The, the rolling average is it's been in the double figures every day for deaths. It has, so what, it has gone up something. to around 100. No, higher than it was that. A, it was around 100 last time I looked, right? But, but these are deaths within 28 days of a, a positive COVID test. And we mustn't forget that on average, about 1,600 people That's die in the saying. UK every day. That's what I'm saying. So if it was 1,000, that would be 10%. If it's 1,500, it's 5% roughly, you know? So what, what's going on? Why are they obsessed with it? Why are they still so obsessed with COVID? I just don't get it. Yeah, it's because we've had this myopic focus mm. for so long. I think everyone's stuck in a, a doom loop. Yeah, I think people are frightened. I mean, luckily, um, not everyone is. I was out in Soho last night and it was absolutely rammed and jumping. You know, there were people falling about drunk. It was great. Tremendous. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it was a bit like it was the last time I was there before COVID even started. And I'm very pleased to see an awful lot of younger people out as well having a good time. Oh, it's so and you just think this is what it this is what London is. You know, I don't want London to just be a gridlocked, you know, tomb of death yeah. where everybody is frightened to get out of a car and everybody's frightened to go on the tube and everybody's frightened to do anything. I mean, it's ridiculous. I know things that I wouldn't have enjoyed in the past, like a queue to get to the bar or being, you know, jammed up close yeah. to people on the tube. I love it now yeah. because it feels like we've got normal life yes, back. Yes, it really does. And that's yeah. why it's even more frustrating that when you turn your gaze towards Westminster, they obviously don't seem to think so. Even though even they've all come back to work, you know, they're not mandating wearing of masks inside the, the chamber, which has been one of the hotbeds of infection, funnily enough, if you remember, everybody in the House of Commons basically got COVID, you know, but they're all still there. Nobody died, literally. So mm. anyway...